everybody. Look at that. Audio is working on the first try. I am so proud of myself. Oh, let's turn on the captions. There we go. Ha! Figures I finally almost know what I'm doing. You do have a question already in the chat. And apparently I have a visitor too. My doorbell just rang. Please hold for one second, chat. I will be right back. You don't need to go. Sorry about that, guys. This is, you know, the world we live in. Where I'm at home and sometimes the doorbell rings. I am bringing up my... Oh, that is very big. I am bringing up my slides. Let's make them kind of smaller though, because that's very big. Yeah, that's good. Let's put that there. And I'll make it bigger. There we go. All right, there was one question already in the chat. So let me see. This is assuming we take all of the ITS 23 exams. Are there any other topics we should study outside of what is listed under subject of examination? Uh, thank you for the question. There are no extra topics. What's listed on the subject of examination is what's going to be on the test, period. They aren't allowed to put anything else on there. That's you know, civil service has to tell you what's going to be on the test. And uh, that's what's listed in the exam announcement. Um, Mike said something about how you have to wait until the tests are scored to dispute a question. And that's not generally true. Usually they do a review session if there are any new questions or anything like that. The week after the exam, you would need to sign up for it when you get to the exam site. They'll tell you whether any questions are going to be reviewable or not reviewable. Um, if everything is not reviewable, they do not have a review session. But if everything is reviewable, or anything is reviewable, sorry, um, then they will have a review session the week after the test. You have to sign up for it and then you go back and you get to bring all of your reference materials with you and look at the questions and look at the reference materials. And if you think they have the wrong answer for any question that is reviewable, you get to write up a little paper about it and send it to them. Um, the next thing I was going to say is, oh, if you saw a question on the exam that you thought was very questionable uh, and you wanted to dispute it or write to civil service about it, you could definitely do that can write to them or call them and say, hey, there was a question on the exam that I think wasn't right. How do I report that? Is the review session in person or virtual? The review session is in person because they give you the questions and then you have to give them back. Um, if it were virtual, they would worry about people stealing the questions. Uh, assuming we take all those. Okay, so I'm sc scrolling down. That's your main questions. Okay. Yep. I'm on it. Thank you very much, Lajaness. What's one here for? Oh, look oh. at that. Captioning we, knows how to spell your name. We now have a new question. What do I need to bring other than my admission note? Um, I will get into that in just a moment. Let me 
show you guys what the agenda is going to be for today first. We have reminders and updates since last stream. We have understanding and interpreting a manual. A wrap up with a quick review of everything and then I'll do more Q&A at the end. I've already been asked one question that I intend to review after or during our wrap up. Eh, maybe after our wrap up, which is the flowchart question about the coins from 2014. Someone asked me to go over that. So I will be going over that towards the end of the stream in case you want to stick around for it. If you don't want to stick around for it because it's a ridiculous question, uh, that's okay too. You can maybe watch it later or something. Um, so the question about the admission note, uh, it says on the back of the admission note what you should bring with you. And uh, when you have your admission note, it also says that you can bring a calculator. Somebody showed me their admission note earlier. So calculators are allowed, but not necessarily recommended. You probably don't need one. So uh, the no food allowed thing would be new. There used to be food allowed for exams, but it's probably a COVID precaution that there's no food allowed. Um, there are not different questions for the different exams. Mike says something about the COVID vaccine status. I'm assuming there were instructions about that in either your confirmation when you registered or your admission notice. So again, all of that stuff needs to go to civil service though, because I'm not civil service. So oh, let me do my disclaimers. I am not civil service. I am Sarah. Hi, everybody. Sarah Louser specifically. Uh, Sarah Lajeunesse is also in the chat and she is helping me out as a moderator. So we're both Sarah. Um, and I do work for New York State IT. You'll see my name on the eligible lists if you, uh, you know, look through the eligible lists. But I'm not speaking on behalf of New York State. I'm not speaking on behalf of civil service or PEF or OITS or anything. This is just me. And I'm also not a mind reader or a psychic. And I'm not going to tell you anything about exact questions on exams because I'm not allowed to. I'm not allowed to tell you anything about exactly what I've seen on past exams other than generalities. And uh, if I had worked with any of the people that wrote the exams or if I had helped to write the exam, I wouldn't really be able to talk to you either. Um, also, I do want to remind people, because it comes up every time, the CSEA booklets are a very good resource, but unfortunately they are not available to PEF members anymore, ever since a couple years ago. If you already had them, great. If you had a friend who had them that can lend them to you, also great. But please don't like post links or uh, talk about copying them or anything in chat. Those are violations of CSEA's copyright, and we like to respect their copyright. They worked hard for those. I got the questions. So is there any reason not to go to the review session? Uh, if you don't really care and you're done with the test, you don't need okay. to go to the review session. Um, they won't let you review all the answers. I can guarantee that. There's preparing written material probably doesn't have any new questions. Uh, the only ones that I think might be reviewable, in my opinion, would probably be flowcharts or systems analysis, but they've had most of those questions for a while too. So I, I don't know whether they're going to have anything reviewable or not. Um, Oops, a lot of people are very, very burnt out after the test. So it's understandable that you don't want to spend some time on your next weekend going to do something for the test too. All right, calculator type. I think I said before that I like the TI-30X2S. Um, hang on one second. Oops. That was a sneak peek. What's coming up? Hang on.
All right, sorry about that delay. Um, big one. I, uh, excuse me. I'm scrolling back up for the questions for a second. Um, I'm them down. So I was on model of calculator. Uh, yep. Thank you. My lovely assistants are helping me out here. <laughs> I was just going to show you guys the one that I was talking about. If it's even in here. Oh, of course it's not in here. Sorry. I must have taken it out for an exam or something. All right, so this one's fine. This is the cheapo like dollar store one. I mean, this one's from Staples, but these guys are fine. Oh, is it this? Yeah, that's the one. Thank you. Thank you. There's my favorite boy. These are like my children. I have so many of them. This one is the one that I was saying that I liked before. Um, it's the TI-30X2S. And I like it because if you type on it, like one, two, three, plus four, five, six equals, um, let me see if I can get it to show up in the thing. Not really. You can kind of see it. There you go. You see how it shows you the line that I just typed and the answer at the same time? That's nice because then you can double check that you didn't mistype something. So I like that double line display. These are just on Amazon or on Staples, I think sells them. Walmart might sell them. I don't know. They're everywhere. Uh, so that's the TI-30X2S. They don't pay me. It's just the one I like because it has two lines of display. Okay. Uh, is this a paper exam or Chromebook? I don't know. You have to ask civil service whether it's a paper exam or a Chromebook. Is there any break during the testing time period? You're allowed to take, uh, just, you're allowed to take, uh, like bathroom breaks and whatever, whenever you want. You're an adult. Um, so it's not like they lock you in the room. There's there, you have to talk to the proctor when you want to take a break. Uh, and you know, just raise your hand. The proctor will come over and you can say, Hey, I have to go to the bathroom or whatever. And they'll let you go out into the hall, go to the bathroom and come back. Okay. How long it, are you allowed to take the test for? Again, that's a civil service question. How long are you allowed to take the test for? Um, if anybody called civil service to get that answer, they could maybe post it up on the chat. But uh, you'd have to ask civil service. The food question I'm seeing some uh, I'm seeing some some questioning about the food because some people are saying it says a light lunch or a snack or quiet snack. Um, then you'd again have to ask civil service. I mean, I guess it probably doesn't hurt to bring like a, a quiet snack with you just in case you can eat it, but especially if it is a long exam. Mm -hmm. um, but it should only be, uh, I think I said 60 questions before and then somebody pointed out that systems analysis might have 30 questions instead of 15, which is true, it might. So that would be like 75 questions. So even if you take like two, three minutes a question that's maybe like three, four hours for your test, you could probably handle not eating for three or four so hours. people in the chat are saying they called or people called and it looks like four hours. Okay. So up to four hours, then that's probably not, you know, you need a snack. You'd be fine. Um, mostly. Obviously, if you needed, uh, obviously, if you needed like for diabetic reasons or something, you needed a snack for some other reason that's an accommodation, you'd have to contact them and make sure that you can be accommodated appropriately. Okay, how long does the test score last in CS database? The test score lasts in the civil service database until either the list expires or the next test is given. So if there's a new list created, it will immediately deactivate the old list even if the old list still wasn't expired yet. They also sometimes do extend the lists if they're not giving a test for a while. Um, that I don't, I don't think that would happen with IT just because there's so much um, movement in the IT workforce that they kind of need to keep refreshing. Are you allowed to bring your phone in? Uh, I believe the, 
admission notice says not to bring your phone. If you can leave it in your car, that's great. If you don't have a car or something and you need to call somebody for a ride afterwards, I would say you can bring it, but I would bring it and I would turn it all the way off and I would put it in some sort of a enclosed bag and just leave it like under your desk or something so that they know that you're not taking it with you or give it to the proctor to hold for you or something. But I would just be double careful, triple careful about that. Okay. Are you allowed to bring in scrap paper? You're not allowed to bring in scrap paper. If you're allowed to have scrap paper, they will provide it for you and collect it afterwards. Remember, they're being protective of their exam questions, so they would uh, not want you to be writing down exam questions and taking them with you or writing down notes and bringing them in. So if they allow scrap paper, which I believe they usually do, uh, you would be provided it at the exam and they will collect it again after the exam. The 23 exam announcement allows you to sign up for multiple sections, datacom, programming, database, and systems programming. Were these all dropped except for the base 23? There are still different lists for all the different parenthetics, uh, but they all have the same questions and the same test. So if I am a hiring manager and I'm hiring somebody for my unit, I might have a position that's already classified as like an ITS3 database position, which means that when I go to backfill that item, that's what they call it, backfill it, um, it would still be an ITS3 database position, so I would need to use the database list for it. Uh, they haven't smashed all the lists down into one because the different uh, parentheticals give you different priority statuses on different lists and they give you different um kind of different career paths a little bit i don't again i don't see them smashing them together into one even though they have the selective cert thing now before we keep going with questions too much more guys yeah. i just want to say i will be doing uh this is this was kind of accidentally i, I clicked through to it before I am announcing that I'm going to do one more stream for you about all of this civil service stuff. What do you expect after the exam? How long do the list last? What does score notice look like? How do eligible lists work? What's the rule of three? How does selective cert work? All of those questions about what happens after the exam, I will be doing on a separate stream. I'm tentatively scheduling it for 423. I don't know if that date's going to work. It might bump out to 430. You might want to bump it because we're going to be coming back. Okay, I'll I'll bump it to 4.30. So tentative date is 4.30. Ignore that it says 4.23. I will make sure that gets updated. Um, and I'll double check because I think I said uh, next week, obviously next week's the exam. The week after is the review. The week after is Easter weekend. And then the week after that, I'm going to be coming home from a vacation. So we're looking at the 30th. Um, but I do want to get back to our agenda. I will keep track of questions and should we do Q&A at the end? Yeah, we'll do the rest of the Q&A at the end. So uh, moderator Sarah is keeping a list of the questions. And if I didn't get to your question yet, I will be doing it at the end. Um, I just want to make sure we get to what I set out in the agenda. I did have one thing I wanted to share with people. I'll definitely share about the test, which is this lovely map. Um, I know that at least a couple people are assigned to the lecture centers, the LCs at UAlbany. So I assume a whole bunch of people are assigned to the LCs at UAlbany uh, because there is a lot of room in those lecture centers. So I'm giving you a little map here of how to get to the LCs and what they look like. So you're going to want to go to SUNY campus. Um, if you haven't been there before, please check online for the campus map for parking for where you're allowed to park. And then campus is kind of set up as there's four giant towers around the outside. Those are residential. Uh, those are where the dorms are for undergrads. And then the whole middle of campus is what they call the academic podium. And it looks like this big gray square here on the, on the map. This square assumes that you're like the top of the square would be where that big circle of Albany is, of UAlbany. So there's that big circle at the front of campus. They call it Collins Circle. 
Um, so the top of this is approaching from that circle. I don't know what order the lecture centers go in underneath, but they go in numerical order somehow. Um, I think somebody I saw had lecture center 18. So if you're, if you're down in the lecture center area and you see lecture center 20, just go in one direction and then turn around and go back if you have to. So the lecture centers are located next to the fountain, but that is kind of underground from where you walk onto the podium. So when you walk from the parking lot onto the podium, you'll kind of walk up a little bit and then you'll have to walk down to get to the lecture centers. So I see somebody in chat said LC7. Um, I will be posting this picture uh, on the NYS ITS site. And this is the map of where the lecture centers are. And then the two pictures on the right here are actually pictures of what the lecture center hallway looks like. And you can see the kind of the fountain in the background and you can see the fountain on the right in the bottom picture. I linked to the map in the... Oh, you linked to one map in the thing? Yeah, it's uh, got other stuff around it, but the, the same things in the center. Okay. Yep. Sounds good to me. But yeah, it's basically go to the middle of campus. There's a giant fountain. You really can't miss the fountain. And all the lecture centers are down around the fountain. So Sarah LJ posted a picture of the uh, UAlbany map. Oh, thanks, Sarah. I'm on it. Oh, it even says Lecture Center 7 on it. Yep. So whoever had Lecture Center 7, I guess you're going right there. You know which side you got to park on. It's not a bad idea if you have time this weekend or the, yeah, this weekend or sometime during the week to go over to campus and find the lecture center you need if you are in a lecture center, just so that you feel like a little bit better about it. You know where you're going, you know where you're going to park, um, you know which side of campus you need to go to, that sort of thing. So it wouldn't be a bad idea if you have a little of t bit of time to go do that. Uh, they won't like yell at you for being on campus or anything, but you know, make sure you park in a visitor parking lot. Okay, so I did want to share that because I know that that's probably a question a bunch of people have. If you have a, a different location, maybe do the same thing. Maybe look up where it is, do a little drive out there or have somebody drive you out there so you can check it out to make sure you understand where you're going on test day because you don't want to be late for the exam. You probably want to be early actually. Um, Let's go to understanding and interpreting manual. Oh, the other thing I wanted to say is some people are assigned to Saturday and some people are assigned to Sunday. There's like no difference. If you needed one day or the other, you probably should have already contacted civil service for accommodation on that. But um, where do we park on test day? That's a great question. I don't know if enough people are taking the test that they're going to open one of the lots for taking the test. For people taking the test, they might have signs that say, you know, civil service test park here. Um, or they might just tell you to park in one of the visitor lots. There are visitor lots closer than a mile away from campus, whatever someone said. Um, there are some visitor lots that are very far away, but there are some that are closer. Um, And I want to go over some understanding and interpreting a manual resources for you because I know this is something that people ask me about a lot. I didn't have anything. I didn't have anything. I went through all those civil service uh, practice questions again, and I did find something that's very similar within the actual questions from civil service. And I did make up a new handout for us to go over that has some practice questions on it. So let's hop right into that. The first thing I want to do is read you guys the civil service description of what these questions are. These questions test for the ability to comprehend a set of directions and apply them. Candidates will be provided with a procedural manual excerpt to read. This information will be used to answer questions about procedures and the way operations should be carried out. 
All of the information needed to answer the questions is provided in the set of directions. Candidates will not be required to have any special knowledge about the content area covered. So especially if it's a procedural manual about like help desk procedures or something, and you work in a help desk, you're going to want to be careful not to bring that outside knowledge in because these questions need to be fair for everybody all across New York State, no matter what agency you work in or what job title you have or what specific job you have, as long as you're eligible for the ITS-3 exam, okay? <clears throat> the next uh, thing I want to show you guys is what I found as a sample question. So keep in mind what I just read to you. This is the sample question I found, which is specifically for one of the security guard series of exams. It says applying written information in a safety and security setting, which evaluates your ability to read, interpret, and apply rules, regulations, directions, written narratives, and other related material. You'll be required to read a set of information and to appropriately apply the information to situations to those similar to those typically experienced in a public safety and security service setting. All information needed to answer the questions is contained in the rules, regulations, etc., which are cited. So you see how that's very familiar or very similar to the manual description that I just read out for you. That's why I think this one is really appropriate for us to look at as a sample question. So the task, you'll be given a set of rules, regulations, or other written information to read. You'll then be asked a question which requires you to apply the rule to a given situation. So I'm going to give you the rule and the situation now. And I'm going to put the answer choices above my head, right in the spot, like here. Um, and I'm going to put up a poll for you to choose what answer choice you like best. Do not post answers in chat, please. Some people take longer to answer than others, and we want to give everybody a chance. I know this one will take a little while because you need to read it. So I'm going to hide myself and mute for a little bit while I put up that question, okay?
Okay, thank you whoever pointed out. It was a bunch of people. Yeah, a bunch of people pointed out that I forgot to actually tell you what the question was. And I apologize for that. I did post it in the uh, poll. The question is, what, if anything, should you record in your notebook? I apologize. I didn't have room to put it on the screen. And that's my mistake. Um, so to everyone who assumed what the question was, be careful about that. And to the people who asked, awesome. Seeing that the question wasn't there. Uh, yes, all of the first three things were true, but only one of them needs to be recorded in your notebook. So the question was, the ABCD is on, um, Dinesh, the ABCD is on the, uh, it's on the video, not on the poll, uh, the values, but that was, uh, our little practice one. So we'll call that a practice. Uh, I'll give you guys the correct answer though. Again, I apologize for the, for getting to give you the actual question, but that's what happens when we're live sometimes, you know? So here was the question. Based on the rule and situation, what should be recorded in your notebook? Um, I see somebody saying their screen is frozen. If it's frozen, please just refresh your browser. It'll come back. Um, the office was dark when you entered it. No one was in the office. The door was open at 11.20 p.m. or no entry needs to be made. The correct answer to this one is letter C. Letter C in, as for cookie, is good enough for me. Um, so just to explain why letter C is the correct answer, the rule that we have states that we should take notes when you observe something out of the ordinary. So it's not out of the ordinary for the assistant director's office to be dark. So letter A is not correct. It is not out of the ordinary for the office to be unoccupied. That is not correct. But it is out of the ordinary for the door to be open. So it says when it you observe something out of the ordinary, that's what you have to write down. So C is the correct answer. Um, that's what you need to be sure to record. I can post this question with the civil service explanations to the uh, the site as well here. Actually, here, I'll put it. I'll put it in the description of this right now. I already have it uploaded, so I just need to get the URL and pop it in the description of our live stream. Okay, the other thing I already put in the uh, the other thing I already put in the description below, and I will pin it in chat right now too, is the practice questions that I made earlier. So I'm going to be posting that to chat right now and pinning it to the top of chat. And we're going to be going to those practice questions. Next. So what do I have for descriptions here? I get that C is strictly necessary, but that's malicious compliance on the part of the guard. I don't think it is because you don't want, you want to be sure that the, uh, the notes are concise enough for people to see where the anomalies are. So. We follow other, the rule. The other question, chicken parm and south paw hair already answered. Okay, thank you. Yep, they didn't. I think they did a good job. I would give them gold stars. Yes. Awesome. Thank you so much, guys. It also feels weird to call a person chicken parm. It does feel a little weird to call people chicken parm, but you know, if you want to be chicken parm, you can be chicken parm. 
<clears throat> there are worse things to be in this world. Chicken parm's good. It's yeah. A solid meal. It is. <laughs> oh, I just realized I'm not on the stream. You guys can't see my lovely face. Where am I? There I am. Hi, guys. Did you miss me? <laughs> Are you laughing at me, Sarah Lajanus? It's just in general. <laughs> it's just us today. Yeah. All right. So I gave you. I gave you the uh, getting a little punchy closer to the exam, you know. Uh, we're going to go over to that practice PDF. The link should be in the description for you and it's pinned to the top of chat. So if you want to go grab that, I'm going to start going over some tips for understanding and interpreting a manual. And a lot of these are just going to be common sense, but it doesn't hurt to reiterate common sense sometimes. <clears throat> just a second. <clears throat> I go through so much water on live stream days. So the first tip I have is to read all the directions carefully. Sometimes when you go to read the question, there is information in the little bit before the procedural manual where it kind of introduces what's going on. So make sure you read all the directions carefully so that you're not missing any extra information that might be written up at the top. As you're reading through your manual, especially if it's a bunch of steps that go in order, make yourself a little mini flow chart if it's helpful. Third, read the question carefully. If I had provided you the question for the sample, it would have been easier for you to do that. But read the question carefully and make sure that you're answering the question that is asked. Remember, sometimes there's the word not, so you need to make sure you circle that and draw big arrows so that you remember to not do that. The next question or next tip I have is to be on the lookout for assumptions. So remember I told you that if it's a help desk procedural manual and you work on a help desk, you might be tempted to just answer the questions with what makes sense. Uh, so just be careful and be on the lookout for those assumptions. So like the one that we just did, uh, people assumed that they needed to figure out what they should write down. Be on the lookout for that. Just watch out for it because it's very easy to make those assumptions and then you might be bringing in some outside knowledge instead of using what's on the manual. Uh, so number five, don't jump to conclusions. If it's not written, you can't just make things up that you should do. Um, even if it seems logical, you only are basing things on what's in the manual. So. I think somebody said earlier there was some malicious compliance going on in that security guard one. Yeah, if it's malicious compliance, then that's what you need to do. Uh, the next tip I have is cross out wrong parts of answers as you find them. So if you're reading through your multiple choice questions and you can find what's wrong with one of the answers, why it's not the correct answer, cross it out, circle it, do something to let you know that that's the wrong part of the answer. And watch out for any exceptions to the rules. So you do need to read the whole manual through once to make sure you can see if there's any exceptions to the rules at like the bottom. Maybe it's a help desk manual that says, you know, here are the priorities for, here's how you set priority for an incident. You know, if it's Affecting this many users is this priority and affecting that many users is that priority. And then maybe there's a whole bunch of other stuff about help desk procedures. And maybe then at the very bottom, we might have a, a little note that says something like all tickets for this person should be priority one. So just make sure you note those types of exceptions. All right, practice PDF time. PDF time, which means I need to open the PDF on my computer. Here 
apparently our chat is fun. Our chat is fun. That's nice. That's better than it being boring and like. <laughs> I like that. This is Chicken Farm's first week joining us live. That's nice. Mm -hmm. Welcome. These are Chicken Farm and Miss Lincoln and Fido. Um, <laughs> you guys are silly. Okay, so here is the PDF. Let me choose the correct PDF. PDF. Flowchart practice. Nope, not flowchart practice. We are doing LMNOP, manual practice. There we go. I found it. So because this section has longer questions right now, um, and like the manual excerpt, that's why I said if you can download this to follow along, please download it to follow along. Um, I'm going to kind of go through it a little bit and I'm going to remind you, do not post answers in the chat. We'll go through the questions one at a time. There are two procedural manual excerpts here and there are five questions about those two excerpts. Excerpts. It's a hard word to say. So uh, please follow along and I will do the best I can to get as much on the screen as I can while still keeping it somewhat readable. We'll see how that goes. So our instructions for this one, and, and again, I made these questions myself earlier. There may be typos or little mistakes that I need to fix. If you see something that is not clear that needs to be updated, please let me know. I'm happy to update it and let everybody else know that we that we have a new version available, okay? I, I really want to make sure I give you guys the best information. And sometimes that means I'm wrong. And I need you to help me get it more right, okay? So understanding and interpreting a manual practice. The following procedural manual excerpt describes sample collection for the main board of pesticides control, BPC. Use the excerpt to answer questions one through three. This is actually a real like agency in Maine and this is their real standard operating procedure. I corrected like one typo and deleted something, but it's based off of their real stuff that I found on the internet. Um, so this first page is our procedural manual, which talks about different things. And then the second page is our three questions. Okay. So I'm going to scroll back up to the top here. And it says main board of pesticides control surface water sampling sites should usually be chosen as a worst case scenario and must be a water of the state and be located near a pesticide use site. And then there's one, two, three, four, five bullet points of directions. And then there are three questions about those bullet points. So what I would like you to do first is look at question one and we're going to focus in on question one to begin with. And I'll put up the poll for you to try to answer question one. Which means I'll hide the next question from you. I just put on a two minute timer as well. If it takes you longer than two minutes, that's fine. I'll put the poll again up in chat. Please don't answer in chat, only answer the poll.
I'm just giving it another minute because uh, I was expecting more poll answers. So I just want to make sure people had enough time to choose an answer before I go over the question. Um, Mike says, are the odd CSEA specific questions about what you should do about your coworkers doing weird scenarios going to be on the exam again? Uh, are you talking about the, Mike, are you talking about the supervision questions? Because that is not a topic for this exam. Yeah, the supervision is not a topic, Mike. Don't worry about that one. All right, so for question one, the correct answer is letter D. D as in donut is the correct answer here. I am going to highlight it for us, if I can find the highlighter button. Highlighter, yellow. Boop. D as in donut. Uh, I just closed the poll because we got enough responses. All right, so for question one, the correct answer can be found by scrolling. Well, I'm going to scroll, but you would go back to the, the previous, just the previous uh, number five, actually where it says for sample IDs, the BPC uses the following format, YYMMDDXXX number number, where YY is the last two digits of the year, MM is a two digit month identifier, DD is a two digit day identifier, XXX would be the collector's initials, and then number number is the sample number for that day. And they even give you some nice examples. They say that if John A. Doe collected seven samples on July 22nd, 1999 from seven different sites, or if he sampled the same site at seven different times, the first sample would be 990722JAD01, and then 02, and then all the way up to 07. So for question one, if I look at my answer choices, all of them meet our criteria for valid sample IDs because we have a valid year number in the first two, a valid month number in the second two, a valid day number in the third set, and then three initials and then two digits, except for letter D where our sampler has forgotten to put 07 instead of just 7. And where could they get the manual itself? This actual procedural manual? Yes. Uh, I, w I pasted, oh, I didn't put the link in the, in the, I mean, I don't quite understand why you'd want the full manual. Someone was just asking me in the chat. Um, don't, don't go get the full man, I mean, I can give you the source for it, but don't go get the full manual because it's irrelevant. I mean, unless you're going to start collecting pesticide samples in Maine. Uh, they're also saying there's no 22nd month in the year. Yes, I did. Uh, right. I did put two mistakes in that one for you. Correct. Thank you for pointing that out. There is no 22nd month in the year. Somebody put year, 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 day, day, month, month instead of, or year, year, day, day, month, month, or maybe day, day, year, year, month, month. Who knows what they were doing? But it's wrong. It's wrong. Good catch. Um, Dan Campbell, understanding and interpreting written material is a completely different topic. This is more like the type of question that you should probably expect for understanding and interpreting a manual. Okay, so Omu, who's the one who's been asking, and I think Dan was clarifying her question. 
Okay. So this is, and she said, I'm using booklet four, understanding and interpreting written material. It yep. has six okay. questions. So Dan and Omu were both using um, the understanding and interpreting written material booklet. That's not what this topic is. Understanding and interpreting written material is basically a reading comprehension. And they give you like a paragraph that is about some sort of a topic. And you have to answer a question about it. It's a very uh, different type of a question than understanding and interpreting a manual. <clears throat> ah, and I see that Dan also got caught with the not a valid sample ID. So remember, look for look, look for those keywords. Somebody says they wonder what would happen if you only had two initials. I don't know. Maybe you would ask them. Maybe you would just get to make up your favorite initial. Uh, let's go into question two, though. So question two says, which of the following would be a characteristic of a sample that was collected in accordance with this standard operating procedure? <laughs> and I will put question two up on the board here. And I will make this a little smaller so that it's only question two. And then... I'll go get that question and then you can answer it later. Do you want? Um, there's a question in the chat. Uh, is it advisable to read the entire manual before looking at the questions? I think it really depends on how long the manual is and how many questions there are. There's only one question. Maybe you don't need to read the whole manual first, but you do need to get an idea of what's going on. So I recommend at least skimming it first before you go to the questions. So I'm going to mute and give you guys a few minutes. Remember, please don't post answers in chat. Please answer the poll that I'm about to put up.
Okay, I'm setting the timer when I put it up for three minutes because I did some math and if you take the four hours that somebody said you're going to be allotted for this exam and, uh, you know, four times 60 gives you hopefully 240. Um, and divide that by 75, which is about how many questions I would assume that you would have. Again, I'm not a psychic. I don't know for sure, but I would I would guess 15 questions per section except for systems analysis, which would be 30. So that would be uh, 3.2 minutes per question. And that would just, again, be an average. I don't know if you remember when we were looking at some of the paragraph organization questions, some of those go very quickly. So if you take longer with some questions and shorter with others, and it averages out to like three minutes per question, that's not bad. So this one does take a little longer than the other ones because you have to kind of evaluate each option. Um, I can tell you what I was thinking when I did it, but I see that the most popular answer was uh, letter B, which is 46% and letter B is the correct answer. Let me take off the done here. There we go. Um, so the question I posted in chat says in accordance with the SOP, I had to shorten it because they only let me put a hundred characters in the, uh, in the poll. So the Roshan pointed out that SOP doesn't equal to BPC, which is the Bureau of Pesticide Control. SOP is just a shortening of standard operating procedure. Um, but you see the question that it was written in your practice PDF does spell out standard operating procedure. So uh, be <clears throat> I, I just had to shorten it to put it in the poll because YouTube limits me on that one. Um, so which of the following would be a characteristic of a sample collected in accordance with the standard operating procedure? The correct answer is letter B. I will go through why I think the other answers were incorrect or why I intended them to be incorrect. Um, and we can, you guys can let me know in the chat if you disagree or if you think there are other problems and maybe we'll adjust this question because this one did have a lot more uh, spread in the answers than the last one. And it is a harder question. So for letter A, the sample was collected in a sterile test tube and then placed in an iced cooler. If I look back at my instructions, so there are basically two pieces of information there. One says that it was a sterile test tube and the other says it was an iced cooler. So we're going to check both of those things out. Maybe it's even three, maybe sterile, test tube, and cooler are three things. Uh, but we'll scroll back up in our PDF here. Let me just uh, find the PDF, there we go. Let me make it bigger again so that I can scroll around. We'll scroll back up to the directions and we'll go for letter A. Remember we were looking for sterile, test tube, and uh, that it should be in an ice cooler. So as I look through here, uh, I don't see anything about test tube specifically. I see this line which says uncap a one liter amber glass bottle certified as pre-cleaned, which is not the same thing as a sterile test tube. Okay. Clean does not mean sterile. An amber glass bottle is not the same thing as an, a test tube. A one liter and a test tube are vastly different sizes, but I gave you a whole bunch of different reasons why uh, it would not necessarily be letter A. Uh, Pre-clean does not have to be sterile. It just has to be cleaned for collection of pesticide samples. So it doesn't say it has to be actually sterile. You're making an assumption if you push it to, it has to be sterile. Um, I did make this one a little bit tricky because at the bottom, the ice coolers for preservation is there. That is a correct part of it, but the first part of that statement was incorrect. 
Letter B, as I said, is the correct answer. Sample was labeled explaining that it is for analysis of a suspected soluble contaminant. So I'll highlight that guy because I said he was the correct answer. So the suspected soluble contaminant, analysis of a suspected soluble contaminant, I'll go to the labeling instructions here on letter on number three, and it says label each bottle with the analysis to be conducted. So that is something that would be on the label. Now the label should have other things on it too, but question two says it's just a characteristic of the sample, right? It says a characteristic, not all the characteristics. So yes, it does need other things on the label, but one of the things that it should have is the explanation that is for the analysis of a suspected soluble contaminant. Letter C, the sample was collected at the shoreline by skimming along the water's surface. So there's two things in this question as well. It's collected at the shoreline and then by skimming along the water's surface. So that's two different things that I'm going to check at the top. So this first number in our procedure seems to be talking about where we should sample things. And it says, once a section is selected for sampling, put on a fresh pair of gloves. And if it's the water body is big enough, way to reach out as far into the river or stream as practicable, or use a sampling pole that extends out beyond the shore. So those two combined make me think that sampling right at the shoreline is probably not what I want to do. The other thing it says is skimming along the water's surface. And I actually, again, gave you something that is in the, in the procedure manual for the second part of that one, which is collect the sample from the upper layer of water by skimming along the surface, which is one of the ways that you can collect a sample. Skimming along the surface is fine, but it says either you have to wade or reach out as far as you can or use a sampling pole to get out as far as you can. The skimming part is there, but the shoreline part is the problem of that one. And then letter D, the sample was filled with a small amount of air at the top to allow for better mixing. That's really only one statement that it has a little bit of air. Well, maybe two things if we said it's for better mixing. Um, but if we, again, look at how should we collect a sample, number two says fill the sample jar completely with no space in the jar, no air space in the jar after the cap is put on. So we're supposed to fill it with no air space. So leaving the air space is incorrect. All right, does that question make sense to everybody now? I see one question about, are we allowed to make marks in the test booklets? Should the test booklets, I mean, somebody said something about Chromebooks, which I haven't seen before, but should the test booklets be paper test booklets? Yes, you, you can mark all over them. You have to write your name on them, actually. It's required to mark on them. Um, question three is about, uh, again about sample bottles, right? But this one specifically says what would be an appropriate set of sample bottles from a site? So you have to look at the given answer choices and we're going to see if we can figure out whether which one of them is an appropriate set of sample bottles, like which one's labeled properly. Let me move this over just a little bit so you can see the full thing. There we go. And I'll give you again a couple minutes and I'll put up the poll.
All right, welcome back. In this set of questions, or sorry, this set of answers, uh, this is testing whether you understand the labeling directions correctly. So A, B, C, and D are all different ways of labeling the sample bottles that might have been collected at a specific site. Um, the correct answer to this one is actually also letter B, just like the previous one. Let me go through Y for you. I'll highlight the answer so that we have it. Oops, no, nope, not like that. I guess not. Highlight this and then highlight this separately. There we go. All right, so let's look at our labeling instructions and then figure out why some of these are not correct. And I'll put myself back on the screen for you because it's nice to have somebody to look at. It's a little less boring if I'm here. <clears throat> so our instructions for labeling up here at the top say that we need a unique identification number and that needs to follow our ID instructions down here. Um, the same ones that we already looked at before. So here were our identification number instructions. And then a date and time collected, a sample location of some sort, and an analysis to be conducted. So each one needs these four parts, right? <clears throat> so an appropriate set of sample bottles from a site. So one of the keywords here is a site, meaning they should have both been at the same site which eliminates letter C because on letter C, I have a difference. I think somebody just said it's like a spot the differences question. It is. Um, on letter C, I have a difference down here between the two different sites. Somebody said they were looking for the instructions about how those site codes came about. It's really irrelevant. Um, there are instructions for it in the actual manual, but all you need to know is that these are obviously two different sites, right? Because they have different identifiers. Um, the next thing that was a clue for us is if we, we can just start at the top and work our way down, right? So for letter A, oops, if I start at the top for letter A here, I'm going to highlight my ID numbers. So you can say I have the same ID number for both of these samples. If I read my ID number instructions, they say if John A. Doe collected seven samples from sites or if he sampled the same site at different times, the first sample needs to be labeled 01, the second 02, etc. They're also saying uh, option C has no time. Uh, I was getting there. Thank okay. you though. <laughs> Thank you everybody for finding it. The location code rule is irrelevant because uh, you don't care how the location, I mean, it could say Mars and Earth. It it doesn't really matter what it says there. It could, it could have a picture of a cat and a picture of a crocodile. If they're not the same, you know it's not the same location. There is no context for the range of acceptable codes, but that's why I put two mistakes in that one that people have already found. We're also missing a time on letter C. So that was the other thing that I left. I was trying not to trick you guys up too much. I did give you two things wrong with that one. And then for letter D, uh, the last piece of information is supposed to be the analysis to be conducted. And for letter D, I instead put kind of like facts about the collection. So this is not a correct thing to put in the, it doesn't, well, maybe you can put facts about the collection, but it doesn't have what analysis you're supposed to do on it, which is what's wrong. 
So even even if we don't know for a fact that AAB PCS one one two and AAB PCS one one three are different sites, we are still missing a timestamp on letter C. So that is also a reason why letter C is not correct. Any other questions about that one before I move on to the next manual excerpt? I do have some other manual samples that I've collected, um, but it's actually kind of hard writing questions about them. So I've only written a couple of questions for you, but I hope this gives you a flavor of what sort of a thing you might expect based on what the exam announcement said to look for. Okay, this one is a much shorter procedural manual excerpt. So I can actually fit this one all on the screen at once for us, which is nice. So we're going to start with question four. And remember, please, again, don't post it in the chat. I will be giving you a couple of minutes to read the excerpt and choose an answer for question four. And then I'll put up the poll as well for you to try and submit your guesses or your correct answers, I should say, because everyone's going to get this one right.
All right. <clears throat> My timer froze because uh, the little timer app thing that I use crashed. So that was fun. I don't know how long that break actually was now. <laughs> but everybody, I think, chose an answer. And I did say pretty much everybody was going to get that one right. So good work. Um, the correct answer is letter D. There is not enough information to answer this question. But you can definitely see why I say be careful not to bring in outside information, right? Be careful not to make assumptions. Uh, so only base your answers on the procedure that you're given. Okay? Any questions about this one? Okay, let's do question five. about whether questions be I see somebody answered that already though. Okay. I'm trying to put the question and the other thing up at the same time. Oh, I forgot to mute. Sorry.
Okay, I was watching the chat. And I do see some people saying that this one's a little tricky and that might just be the way I wrote it isn't very good. So we will uh, we'll update it together to address some of the things that you guys are saying. Uh, I'm gonna end the poll now. The answer I intended to be the correct answer was letter C. Um, but somebody did correctly point out that steps four and five don't actually say when you should do them. Um, which is a good point. Uh, maybe if I said while hiring, follow the following, uh, do the following steps in numerical order. That would address that if I just updated my instructions a little bit, right? So maybe the procedure at the top, I'll just change this instead to be, let's see. I'm gonna mark it up so that I can remember what to do later. So maybe if I just did this, hiring procedure, and then How does that sound? Does that seem clear? For as far as the order thing goes? And is it even on the screen? No, it's not even on the screen. Cool. Why is it not on the screen? There we go. What do you guys think of it now? Now that I put it on the screen with a little bit better, little bit better instruction. Does that seem a little bit better? When should you ask a candidate to provide their AC? That might be a little bit better. Um, what if I changed it to say, and thank you guys for helping me make these questions a little better. I intended it to be letter C, but you're bringing up some very good points about some of the nuances of the wording. So again, thank you for helping me workshop these questions a little bit. I will update the PDF and post the new one very shortly here. Um, how would you feel if I changed it to must? Does it seem clearer? Oh no, my mouse died. I need a new battery. If I just took out the word should and I put the word must instead there. I'm asking anybody who wants to answer me. It's not dead. The mouse is dead. It's fine. I'll fix it in a second. We're going to take a little break before I go into the next bit anyway. And I'll update this and I'll get the new one up. I think must is more clear. Okay, good. 
Thank you guys for your help with it. You can see why what I intended, even, you know, even I can get caught up with some of the nuances of it. So what I intended was, you know, when does the candidate need to provide it? When will they be asked for it? But I didn't want to put the exact words, when should you ask for it? I wanted to make it a little bit harder than that. So I will change the answer choices a little bit too. It's about after selected means, yeah, you select someone to hire. I mean, that that's what I would assume. There's two evaluation rounds and then it, there's some sort of a selection and it says ask, there's no details here about what the selection is, just that there are selected candidates. Somebody says, this test seems easier than prior tests. Do you think they're looking for more 23s because the test was delayed so long? Uh, it's exactly the same set of subjects as it was last time, I believe. And it wasn't delayed very long at all. If you think this was delayed too long, then uh, I got sad news for you about working for New York State because this was pretty par for the course. 2010, 2014, 2017. This one's a little bit late but 2010 to 2014 was not a pandemic and it still took four years for a test. Um, they are trying to do them more frequently for IT especially, but let me look up. I'm just double checking the scores, my score notice for the last exam, uh, my exam announcement for the last 20. Nope, that wasn't the one I wanted. This one. Yeah, since the uh, 2014 exam, there have been only these four topics on the ITS threes. So the 2014 exam was when they changed it. 2014 and 2017 are both uh, were both only these four topics. So uh, they haven't changed what the topics are for a number of years. And uh, Michael said this test seems easier than prior tests. I think that. Please remember, these are not actual test questions. These are my best interpretations of what you can expect based on the examination announcement. Okay, that's where that's where I always start from. What are the topics? Uh, I'll go over this again after the break, but the topics are systems analysis, and then preparing written material, flowcharts, and understanding and interpreting a manual. We're going to take a seven minute break, <laughs> and I will come back and I will do a quick review of all the topics and some of the tips for all of the different areas. And then I will answer that flowcharts coin problem and we'll go into the rest of Q&A. Okay, that's the plan. So I'll put up the timer and we will be back in about seven minutes.
Welcome back. Start back up the captions here. I know the captioning is not the best. I mean, it's just automated captioning, but I'm hoping it helps some people I'm trying to be accessible, make it a little easier for people. I know sometimes it says some ridiculous things, so I apologize for that part. If, uh, if it says ridiculous things while I'm talking, but <laughs> hopefully it's at least close enough for you to uh, follow along. I am just uploading our new updated thing here. Sorry, one second. Copy link address. I'm giving you an updated link in the description for that. And then I'm just going to upload a new version of that, the fixed version of the thing that we just made. That we all made together. If you still see the old version, by the way, when you come up to the uh, site and you if you click to download and you still get the old version with the question that's not um, the, the where that fifth question is not as clear, it's probably just cached somewhere and it'll, and it'll update soon. So I will be uploading the new version right now. should be good. Posting the new link in the chat. Not in the chat, in the thing. Okay. And I'll put an answers PDF up for that later as well. Let's unpin our pinned chat because we don't need that anymore. All right. Let's see what questions I missed while I was working on that. <sighs> Somebody said it's difficult to find material about the understanding manuals. It, it is. It's very difficult. That's why I was trying to make some material for you guys. I actually saved off a whole bunch of other manuals to try to make some more material, but I did uh, run out of time a little bit. Um, so at least I gave you a couple examples to kind of maybe set your mind a little bit at ease about what that's going to ask of you in, you know, in my best guess. Like, I, again, not a psychic not charging by the minute for a 900 number for you to call Miss Cleo. We're, we're not doing that. Wow, that was a dated reference. It's okay. We're going on. Onwards and upwards. Uh, the SDLC book and systems analysis in general is, again, it's a best guess based on what was written. Unfortunately, it is a very broad topic. If you're working in IT, though, you're probably doing systems analysis projects in general. And any exposure you can get to that as part of your normal everyday job is going to help you answer those questions as well. Um, my very first exam that I did, I just went and got all my score, score notices earlier um, off the civil service site. So I'm just going to give you guys a little anecdote here about the very, very first exam baby Sarah did when she was going for 23, um, in 2010, I took the ITS-3 exam, and that was my first time I had systems analysis, and I had no idea what to study, and I got 15 out of 15 correct. I got less, fewer correct in supervision, in a couple of other things that used to be on the exam. There used to be a section called Principles of Providing User Support, 
There used to be a section called Project Management Fundamentals. Um, so this test in just this is just for your information. Uh, this was 2010. It had one, two, three, four, five, six. It had 90 questions. And I got, I'm very good at taking tests. So please, you know, keep that in mind as it's not a humble brag. It's just a fact. Um, I got three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I, I, I got eight out of the 90 questions incorrect. And they gave me a final score of 95. But that was actually the highest score in the entire list. So my list rank was actually one, even though I only got a 95. And even though I missed eight questions. So, it's, and I've gotten hundreds on exams before, missing questions. It's always possible. Don't worry too much about it if you miss a couple questions. Um, scrolling down some more. SDLC is deep. Yep. Uh, Dinesh asked the question about client server versus web-based. Uh, what, what I would do for that is go on like Wikipedia and look up what client server is and look up, you know, that architecture stack and just kind of click around anything you don't understand to get some ideas about that one. Uh, Mike says there's no actual programming questions on the programming exam. That's correct. All of the different parentheticals are taking the same exam. There's no programming questions. Somebody mentioned there used to be a pseudocode section, which was very, <laughs> that one was horrible. <laughs> Assembler pseudocode was the worst, uh, but it's not there anymore. Uh, <laughs> All right, some questions about downstate, some questions about email. Yeah, so if you didn't get your exam notice yet, you should probably contact civil service just to make sure. Um, Thanks, Adam. I like your quoting me. <laughs> How about grammar? There is no grammar on this test, actually, except for the uh, the bit that's in the preparing written material, which is only a tiny little baby bit of grammar. Uh, so that's where we're heading right now, actually. Let's go back to the slides. I'm going to put my slides back up. I don't need my PDF. I need my keynote. There we go. I certainly don't need the other PDF either. There we go. Slides. Okay, so we did our practice PDF. So now we're going to do the review of all the topics. This is going to be very brief, but other than understanding the manual section, I mean, it's the section is totally called understanding and interpreting a manual. Um, but I had to shorten it because it was making my whole slide go all wacky. Um, so systems analysis, we've talked a little bit about it in the chat and I've mentioned it a couple of times. That is definitely the broadest section on this test. Um, usually test sections have 15 or 30 questions. Uh, out of this particular exam, it is highly likely that systems analysis would have 30 questions and each of the remaining three topics would have 15 questions. But I, again, not a psychic, can't predict that for, for sure. Um, so for systems analysis, the types of things you should be studying again are like system development, system development life cycle, software development life cycle. It's kind of, uh, some people say one, some people say the other. Technically it's, preferred system development life cycle because the answer is not always software. That's one of the things to study in systems analysis. Uh, another thing to study for systems analysis this is all in your exam announcement, by the way. Um, which again, if you don't have your exam announcement, if you go on the NYSITS site, NYSITS.org, you can find links to the exam announcement and to all of the resources that I've collected so far for this particular exam. It's pinned right to the top of that site right now. 
I mean, there's also a countdown timer to tell you how many days you have left, but hopefully that doesn't make anybody too anxious. Um, so the exam announcement for your exam is posted right there on the site and it has the subjects of examination. They're in a different order, but same difference. So it says for systems analysis, feasibility and application studies, system development tools and software, systems lifecycle, types of systems, like the client server web base, the whole stacks of systems, controls, systems documentation, testing and implementation. Your main resources for that, you have some videos that I've done before, but I always refer you to that New York State guidebook which is where a lot of the information from those videos comes from because that is a free resource for SDLC that is like an official New York State document. So you can get that and go through it and learn more about, you know, the system development life cycle. I also have recommended that people pick up a used systems analysis textbook. It can be a couple uh, a couple issues out of date, that's fine. It's obviously a bit late to do it now, but if you happened to pick one up either in a previous exam cycle or earlier in this exam cycle, uh, one of the good things to do there is to look through, look at the chapter titles for every chapter in the table of contents and anything that you really don't understand or you don't know what they're going to be talking about in that chapter, Go flip to that chapter and just kind of skim through it a little bit. Maybe skim the headings and see if you can learn a little bit more about that topic. Or take that keyword and again, pop it into like Wikipedia or something and look for a, a synopsis of it. Okay. Um, preparing written material. We did that one last week in our live stream. All of those should be linked in the, on the Toner Tutoring channel. And they're also linked in a playlist together and they're all on the NYS ITS site as well. So you shouldn't have any trouble finding all the new stuff, which is way more watchable than some of the old stuff. Um, those 2010 videos are, oh boy, some of those are bad, but they were better than nothing. Uh, so preparing written material was the two types of questions. The one type that was a paragraph restatement, information restatement question. And that was where they gave you a couple of sentences and then they asked you which of the following things restates this properly. And remember, we had a couple of things that we had to worry about there. Uh, that was we were looking for restatements that were, first of all, accurate. You couldn't change the facts around at all. And second of all, we were looking for restatements that followed a couple of grammar rules. The two grammar rules that we talked about in that video were pronoun uh, ambiguity or pronoun, incorrect pronoun usage and misplaced modifiers. And they're kind of very similar topics, but if you need to go over that again, please go pop over to that live stream. Um, and I will, I did mark it up with some timestamps. And I think I just saw on the chat that, and I'm so sorry if I say this wrong, Roshan, who also timestamped the first video for us on our first live stream. So round of applause for, for you. Um, thank you very much. And they just told me that I need a 0000, 000 timestamp. So I will do that so that that one gets properly chapterized. I was wondering why it wasn't chapterizing, but, um, so that's the first type in preparing written material. Remember, it has to be accurate and then as clear as possible. And it, style mattered a little bit, like repetition wasn't as good or awkward sentences aren't as good. The second type of question was when we had to do paragraph organization and put things in order. And one of the things we had to do in that section was look for like red flag words or question marks. So pronouns where you didn't know what they were referring to or statements like the governor in the example that we did where it said the governor and you're asking yourself as you're reading that sentence, what governor, which governor are you talking about? Um, those were all question mark words and we needed to find the answers to those before we could use those questions. So we kind of marked up those red flag question mark words or phrases and then we looked for a topic sentence and we looked for strong links between 
sentences to kind of guide us into our answers. And then use that to find, eliminate ones that were obviously wrong and find the best set of materials. We also talked about going, how paragraphs, when they're well-structured, go from more general statements to more specific statements. And they also would use longer versions of descriptions or longer versions of words. And then maybe we'll use acronyms or shorter versions later on in the paragraph. One of the examples of that was something about email uh, that I use in another class I do for CSEA. They have one in the in their book that talks about something, something email. And uh, earlier in the same paragraph, it says something about electronic mail. So the electronic mail part comes first, and then later on it refers to it as email. So any abbreviations like that generally come later than the full versions of the words. Uh, if you want more practice with preparing written material, CSEA does have a very good booklet on it. And I, I'm going to give you the same caveat. There is no way for you to purchase that booklet right now or for you to obtain it as a PEF member, PEF member. Sorry, it keeps, no, nope, PEF. Come on, caption, you can do it. There we go. <laughs> um, it, they're for CSEA members only at this point. If you happen to have an older copy or if somebody can loan you a copy, that would be a great way to use it. It is booklet 17, if you are looking for it, booklet 1717, um, preparing written material. Flowcharts. We talked about a couple flowchart examples. I'm going to do another one for you today, which is the infamous coin problem. Um, so in these flowchart examples, we talked about kind of looking through the flowchart and kind of understanding what's going on with it, writing up a nice table. Uh, somebody says, if it's obtainable freely online, can I tell here how to find it? No, you cannot. If it is available freely online, that is supposed to be for CSEA members only, or it is somebody that is violating uh, CSEA's copyright, and I cannot allow you to post that. It will be removed. Um, there is not a CSEA booklet about interpreting a manual. Uh, flowcharts, iterations, set up a lovely little iterations table maybe, uh, go through the iterations, look for patterns, look for any jumps or breaks out of loops, uh, and it's always a good idea to write down your, your first and your last iteration in full just to make sure that you're understanding what's going on in those last iterations. And as you're working on your flowcharts, just work neatly and, you know, mark your scrap paper as neatly as you can. Understanding manuals, we just did. I don't really need to go over that one again. We just did that one, like not too long ago. If you missed it, you can rewind or wait for it to queue up and replay later. I also wanted to say I sent out an email to everybody who was subscribed to the uh, NYS ITS site. Uh, and I posted it as well. It's just down a little ways because I, I have the pinned post about all the resources and then I have the pinned post about the ground rules and then there's the live stream reminder and a new resource. So one of our fellow New York State IT professionals, uh, Cedric, made a brand new website to help IT people study. And I'm not affiliated with the site. I want to make sure that that is clear. It is not my site. I'm not paid to endorse it or anything like that. Um, but Cedric said it's not where he wants it to be. It's still a work in progress. But if you can get some use out of it, you can consider trying to uh, check it out. It's examsny.com, E-X-A-M-S-N-Y.com. Uh, I went on it earlier. I found some questions that were not quite... Uh, matching what sh should be on your exam. I let Cedric know. He pulled those ones out. So there's some good practice questions on there. Not everything is necessarily the right level of detail for the test or as clear as a test question might be, but it is more practice for you to learn as you go. Okay. 
So again, that's examsny.com if you want to go visit Cedric's site. And I will actually put that in, I'm not gonna put it in the description here, but I'll put it in my on my other site. I, uh, I don't wanna like keep it in this YouTube because I don't control over it. And I'll forget about it and then it'll be broken. I don't wanna do that to you. Okay, what else did I have on my list? Uh, <laughs> the coin flow chart. That's the only other thing I have written down right now. You want to answer questions first in case people don't want to stay for coin flow chart? Um, yeah, we can do. Hang on, let me just double check my slides. Make sure I don't have any more slides hiding. Nope. Cool. All right, that is all the slides. So okay. we'll put me here. Uh, while I set up my iPad to do the coin flow chart, we can answer. I can do some more Q and A. Sarah will shoot. Sarah will shoot me questions and I will answer them. Is it four hours for all five exams? Uh, any time that you're given would be for all five exams, but it's not five separate exams. It is one exam that happens to fill five lists. Okay. So it's not different questions for the different exams. It is one exam that fills five lists. When does the current list expire? Like when the score list come up or whatever? The current list will expire when the new list is established. So if you go on the civil service site right now, uh, cs.my.gov, and I'll show you guys how to do this in that extra live stream that I'm scheduling. Um, you can go to the lists. I'm gonna look it up right now. It's gonna ask me to log in because I'm looking at my lists apparently. No, I can't log in. I don't want to log in. I want just list by name. There we go. IT specialist three. You'll see if you go, oh, you know what? Let me share this screen. Let me, let me show you guys what I'm doing here. Um, yeah, sure. Why not that one? What's it called? List by name. Okay, so this is what the civil service eligible list look like. This is going to be very brief, <laughs> a very, very brief introduction to this. So you can get to it by, you go on, well, I'll just show you very briefly, cs.ny.gov. This is the civil service site, and it's apparently cut off a little bit in your screen, but that's okay. You don't need the whole site to see what I'm doing here. Scroll all the way to the bottom, and there's a thing here where it says, you see it says Elms eligible list eligible lists elms online so we're going to click where it says elms which brings you to the eligible list management system and then uh, in this section that says eligible lists here if you click on the top ones it's going to make you sign in because those are all ways that you can manage your lists the bottom ones here are you don't have to sign in for so i'm just going to click by name and then i'm going to click i for it scroll down until I get to information technology specialist. You'll see a bunch of ITS2 lists. Uh, the way the ITS2 lists are pulled, every time somebody wants a different set of skills, it makes a brand new list. So you'll see a whole bunch of those. So we're going to scroll past those. And now you'll see that there are two different information technology specialist three lists. Last time they gave the exams, they had an open competitive and a promotional. And I'll go over what those are again next time. But if you... Uh, if you see here, the first date, let's scroll back up so you can see. The first date is the start date right here. I can't highlight it. There we go. And then the right hand date is the end date, but you see it's got a little asterisk. So it's kind of the end date. So when you scroll down to the one that was just administered in 2018, it was administered in 2017. The list didn't come out until 2018. It takes about Took us about six months last time to, or more to get the list. Um, and it was extended until 2026, but that is not when it's going to expire. That would be when it would expire if no tests were given. As soon as the new test is given and the new list is established, this will expire. Okay. All right, next question. <clears throat> Do I need my VAX card? Uh, that is a great question. There is a VAX policy. 
I think I linked it on the NYS ITS site. Let me just double check it. Please note, as of December 21st, 1st, 2021, there's a mandatory vaccination testing policy. You can read more about the policy on the Civil Service website. So I would recommend going here and reading this because it gives you more information about the policy. Okay. How can you get back onto the grade 18 list if you don't do well on the test? Uh, just you have to keep uh, yourself active on the list. I think you have to once a year go in and like, click a button or reapply or something. Um, you just keep yourself active on the list the same way you would. Um, but if you're already in a grade 18 title, do you really need to be on the grade 18 list? I don't think you do. When you are crossed off a list after an interview because you weren't interested in that particular position, how do you put yourself back on the general list? Uh, you should be able to, where I just showed you on that Elms online thing, you should be able to um, see your declinations there and like your current status on lists. It really depends. I'll go over all that stuff in a month when we do the civil service thing. Okay. What are the topics on the exam? All right. For the 400th time. <laughs> just kidding. I know some people didn't come in earlier. Going over it one more time. Four topics for you. Preparing written material. Systems analysis, flowcharts, understanding and interpreting a manual. That's it. Four topics. Okay. Uh, do you have formulas for the exam or a link for formulas, math-specific formulas? I think I responded to that one in the chat. The math formulas were for tabular reasoning, which is not on the exam anymore for this administration of it anyway. It was on the exam, I think, in 2010 only, maybe. I don't know. It was only for certain types anyway. Okay. So this last one is about flowcharts. In flowcharts, if there is a question mark as opposed to decision yes or no, what should we assume? And they mean actually in the diamond. If there's a question mark as opposed to yes or no. Well, there should always be little arrows going out from the diamond, right? There should be arrows going out from the diamond that have labeled on them which which way is no and which way is yes. If there are no labels on the arrows, I would say that that's probably an awful flow chart that you should probably be able to challenge because there's not enough information to answer. Um, I don't know what the question might be asking other than that though, because all I can think of is if the arrows coming out of the decision diamond weren't labeled, you'd have problems, right? But they should be labeled. Uh, if the question is just whether it matters if there's a question mark inside the diamond or not, uh, that doesn't really matter. I mean, you can just assume that the diamond decision point is some sort of a yes, no, true, false. That's standard flowchart convention. So this is the one area where it says right in the description, you must know standard flowchart conventions in the subject of examination description so that is a flowchart convention that you would need to know that decision diamonds generally have yes no true false sort of answers so we have one last question in the chat how do we find the sample questions from the civil service site um i've put them all in the live streams uh all the questions <laughs> that exist there aren't many of them there are literally like three written material questions for each type of written material and there's the one question about manuals that we did today. That's all that exists on the civil service site right now. If you want to look for yourself, um, let me get the link for you. Give me one second. I will get the link and post it in the chat. But you're more than welcome to look for yourself, but there's nothing else out there. So I'm just going to clicky click my way through the site the same way I always do to get to it. I have it saved somewhere, but sometimes it's easier for me to just click through.
Can you post the link to civil service site? It's just cs.ny.gov. Civil service.ny.gov. CS.ny.gov. Yep, that's civil services website. Boom. Thanks, Sarah. Um Oh wait, I know where I put it. I know where I put that link, Kingman. Civil service guides. And we are going to go over that coin flow chart problem as well. So do you want to stick around and go over that problem? Uh, that is a very hard problem and may, may not even be indicative of what you can expect on the test. But sometimes it's good to stretch your brain and have something really hard because then the test will feel easy. Um, yeah, I can't find that site right now. It's a little... Oh, test guides and resource booklets is what I wanted. That's exactly what I wanted. All right, so... Here is the link to NYS civil, civil Service Test Guides. There you go. But like I said, there's nothing new there for you. There are literally, out of all the options available and all the different test guides that exist there, I literally looked through every single one of them for any extra questions and there aren't any. A lot of them have preparing material, but they're all using the same sample questions about uh, the guy who caused an accident or no, his failure to take precautions caused an accident or something. And the one about job opportunities for, for putting the sentences in order. Dan has a question about what motivated me, to, made me to start doing this. I actually got motivated to start doing this because I have a lot of friends that are in IT titles, right? I'm in an IT title that are good programmers. They're good developers and they should be eligible for promotional opportunities, but they're just not good at taking tests. And actually now that I'm in a managerial role, I want to be able to, you know, as I was coming up through the ranks, I want to be able to make sure that as many people as possible that should be eligible are eligible, right? And not artificially limit the pool to just people that are good at taking tests. Um, because it makes the promotional opportunities more fair for everybody. Okay, so it may not be IT related, right? Interpreting a manual? So oh, yeah, no, it could be any sort of a manual. All right. It doesn't say. Yep. That's your last question in the chat. So now it's time for coin flow chart. Thanks, Sarah. Keeping us on task. Um, I did want to just mention the tip jar. It's almost full. Excellent. It was all our goals. And thank you for everybody who's been able to toss something into the tip jar. I appreciate it. And the tip jar will be open. Like if you want to keep throwing things in later, I'm, I'm obviously not going to complain about that. But yeah, we're going to do the civil service uh, stream as like a little bonus stream anyway. And... I'll probably put up a goal for that one too, but I do appreciate all the support. And let's go over that coin flow chart. <laughs> You're in rare form today, dear. <laughs> I think we had a little too much caffeine here earlier. Never. Never? Okay. Oh man, I could have used the train whistle, but so casually. Please don't. Uh, obviously I wouldn't. I'm trying to connect my iPad to this computer right now. I don't know why it's not showing up as a, as a source. No, that's not what I wanted. Sorry about this guys, one second. And if anybody wants me to go over any other specific questions, you can ask in the chat and I'll get to them too. Assuming that it's not something that's going to take forever and that I've already answered. Um, 
If I've already answered it, then I'm probably not going to answer it again. I'll just refer you to the previous answer. Nope. Okay, hang on. We're going to unplug and replug and see if that makes it wake up. It's IT, right? Have you tried turning it off and back on again? It's always the first thing to do. If I can't get this one to work, then I am going to do it a different way. There it is. There's going to be a little record button, um, but you guys can ignore that little record button. All right, let's choose the correct source here now, which is this one. Yeah, it is. And this is way, way, way too. Why does it think it's 9.41 AM? That's weird. Daily savings time. Yes, <laughs> saving a lot of time, apparently. Right. So this is the add a coin example from the 2014 flowcharts. And that is linked in the description. The uh, post about the 2014 flowcharts, the coin flowchart. It's linked in the description for you. But I'm just going to be going over the answer for this one. So if you have not done this question yet uh, and you want to try it, now is the time to pause this live stream or leave and come back after you've tried it. I will say this question is a little ridiculous. Um, I had two different people earlier today basically rage flip the table on it. They both hated it a lot. A lot of people hate this question. It is not a great question, but it does showcase some good logic and we can showcase a couple good flowchart techniques as part of this question. Okay. Um, so this is the add a coin procedure. And it assumes that the coin being added is either a nickel or a penny. Okay, so that's a first assumption. I'm going to maybe highlight that with a nice big highlighter. Again, I'm going to be looking down a lot because I'm working on my iPad here. Um, but it's either a nickel or a penny. Uh, somebody earlier today pointed out to me that we should also assume that with the question we're asking at the bottom uh, here where it says, why is this not updating? Where it says, why is this not updating? Um, this one? No, this one? Either one of you wants to update, I will be super happy about that. There we go. That's the right one. Um, where it says there are 27 total coins processed. Uh, somebody pointed out to me earlier that we should say there are 27 total coins processed before the flow ends at the stop terminator. 
because they pointed out to me that this one could be uh, there were 27 coins processed and there's still more coins waiting to be processed. Um, so we'll update the question to say before the flow ends at the stop terminator. All right, so we're going to add either a nickel or a penny. And I'm going to just scroll down a little bit here past that part. So I don't need the start terminator. That doesn't really tell me anything. Uh, if you saw my other flowchart video, I've been labeling things with the statements with numbers just to make it easier for me to talk about them. You don't necessarily need to label things with numbers on your exam. It just, again, makes it easier for me to talk about. So I'm going to do one for that statement, two for the decision diamond, three A for the left hand side of the path, three B for the right hand side of the path. And you see they come back together. So I'll do four for the next one and then five, then six, seven for the last decision diamond. And then I'll just label these guys around in a loop here, um, eight, nine, and 10. Okay. So you can see that just looking at this, cause I'm going to need to kind of squidge things up a little bit so that I can see more of it on the screen. And I want to leave it big enough that if you full screen it on your computer, you should be able to kind of see what I'm doing. I'm going to just scroll up a little bit so that the add a coin goes away. And I'm just going to put a note here you just so that we remember that it just goes to add a coin. Just so that we know that we're just going to add a coin and then come back down to nickel. Okay. So now I've got the whole flow on here at least. So we have some sort of a process and every time I put in a coin, the first question that gets asked at statement two here is, is it a nickel? And if it is a nickel, we increment letter B by five and letter C by five. And if it is not a nickel, that means it must be a penny that was in our instructions, remember? So I'm gonna make a note here, know that it's a penny. So we increment A by one and C by one. Looking at our variables, I can see that somehow pennies are only affected, or only, or letter A is only affected by pennies, and letter B is only affected by nickels. Right? So I know that those variables somehow have something to do with pennies and nickels. Letter C being affected by both of them must be some sort of a total, right? No matter which way I go, letter C gets changed. So C must be some sort of a total. And I'm going to just keep popping coins in this thing until I get C bigger than 100. And once it's bigger than 100, then I go down into my print statements and I, sorry, I just nudged it. I go down to my print statements and I do a weird thing with dividing out B and then uh, doing something with D and coming back around and printing A and B again and stopping. Okay. Now, if there are 27 coins total processed, so these are the things that are written in the question, which is just below the screen right now. You can't quite see it. So I'm going to write them on the side here. 27 coins processed. Oh, that is too far to the side. It's not on your screen. Let's see. How about if I write here? 27? There we go. 27 coins. And it says the last three coins are nickel, penny, nickel. So that means I had 24 coins that I don't know. And then I had nickel, penny, and nickel. And then what does C equal at the end of the flow? So they want to know what this like total thing equals at the end of the flow. 
And I don't need to worry about it changing because past this line, boop, 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 on that square I just drew, none of that affects letter C, right? So I'm just kind of looking at the top part of this flow. Is there any way you can make it so they can see the whole chart on their screen? Um, the only thing that's not there is the add a coin thing. Okay, they're just asking. Or someone's I mean, asking. See, it says start add a coin. That's the only thing that you can't see right now. Uh, and then what does C equal at the end of the flow? So this is a question that is kind of testing you on a couple things. It's somebody says it seems more like a math question than a flow chart question. You can answer it with algebra. Yeah, you can. Um, it's kind of testing logic a little bit and it's testing that you can kind of follow this flow chart around and understand more what the flow chart means instead of just blindly following the flow chart. Um, but it is mostly a uh, a thinky sort of a question. Uh, so 27 coins total, right? Here are the bits that matter right now. Um, and somebody asked for the full question. The full question says we process 27 coins. So total equals 27 coins. That's statement one. Or that's the first part of the question here. The second part of the question says that the last three coins were nickel, penny, nickel. And the third part of the question says value of C at the end. That's what we're looking for. It doesn't give you this part here about the 24 coins, nickel, penny, nickel. It just gives you the nickel, penny, nickel. So that's the first logic part, is that there must be 24 coins before that nickel, penny, nickel happens, right? That's the first logic part that we're talking about. So the next question is, okay, well, I don't know what those 24 coins are. How could I possibly answer this question? And the way that you go about answering a question like this is you kind of have to just make a guess and go for it and see where that lands you so you can understand what's going on a little bit better. So make a guess at one of the extremes. Either all 24 are nickels or all 24 are pennies. I'm going to choose all 24 are nickels because that seems a little more interesting than 24 cents, right? Because if I only have 24 pennies, C is only going to get up to 24, right? Because C is C plus 1, in increments by 1 for each penny. So it'll only be 24 by the time I get through those 24 coins. So if I add a nickel, a penny, and a nickel, that won't get me out of my loop. It'll still be waiting for more coins because C will not be 100 yet. So I'm going to, I mean, I can write that down, I guess. I'll write down, let's make our first assumption. All 24 coins are pennies. So if all 24 coins are pennies, when all of those pennies have gone through, that would be C equals one for each penny times the 24 pennies, which is 24, right? And then we still have a nickel to add. So when I add the nickel, that's going to be C plus five, right? That's right here is the C plus five and the C plus one. So if I add a nickel, that's going to be 29. And then I add a penny, it's going to be 30. And I add another nickel, it's only 35. So you can see if I did 24 pennies and then nickel, penny, nickel, I would end up with C equals 35, which is nowhere near enough to break out of this loop down into the printing part, right? Because we need C to be bigger than 100 to break out of that loop. Okay, so all 24 coins can't be pennies. 
I'm going to just erase this bit because I'm going to run out of room. And, you know, YouTube has recorded it for posterity for me. So I'm going to go the other direction and assume all 24 coins are nickels. So what would happen at the end of that? My C value would be the 5 per nickel times the 24 nickels would be 120. So I would have broken out of the loop long before I even put in those 24 coins. So it must be fewer than 24 nickels, right? So now we're going to just choose a number that is somewhere between 0 nickels and 24 nickels. You can see that this 120 is much closer than the 35 was, right? We're kind of trying to get to that 100 breakpoint as close as we can to it so that the flow will stop at the right point. So let's try maybe 20 nickels next, okay? So if I do 20 nickels, that means there are four pennies. So C at the end of those 20 nickels and four pennies is going to be five times 20 is a 100 plus one times four is four. So it'll be 104. But again, now I don't have room to put in another nickel, penny, and nickel because I will already have broken out of the loop, right? So 20 nickels, four pennies is still too many nickels. My C level is getting too big. The C level is rising too high. That's such a bad joke. Oh gosh. Um, all right, so we just tried 20 nickels and four pennies. I'm gonna rewrite that again. Again, I'm running out of room, so I'm just gonna erase it. So we tried 20 nickels and four pennies, and that was too much. Now we're gonna try knocking it down a little bit more. Let's knock it down to 16. We knocked it down by four last time, so I'll knock it down by another four. So 16 nickels, which would mean eight pennies. So 16 times five is 80. Eight pennies times one is eight. So C would be 88, right? And remember, I have to add that last nickel, penny, nickel. So if C is 88, and then I add a nickel, a penny, and a nickel, we just have to make sure that we're gonna break 100 only on this last nickel, right? If I get past 100 before that last nickel, that means I would have broken out of the loop too early. And if I'm not at 100 yet by the time that last nickel has been added, that means that I am breaking out of the loop too late. So I'll need to adjust a little. So 88 plus five is 93 plus one is 94 plus five is only 99. So that would mean I would need one more coin to break out of the loop. So 16 nickels is too few. Then I'm just going to try 17 because that's the next one available, right? We were pretty close that time. So 17 nickels, which would be seven pennies. Seventeen times five is eighty-five. Yes. Eighty-five. Seven times one is still seven. So before we do our nickel penny nickel, eighty-five plus seven is ninety-two. So I'm going to start at 92, and I'm going to add a nickel, a penny, and a nickel. 92 plus 5 is 97. So we're still good. We would still add the penny. 97 plus 1 is 98. So now I need to keep going. We're still good. And then I'd add the nickel, and I'd get to 103. And now when I go to statement 4 and I evaluate whether C is bigger than 100, Oh, I just realized you guys can't see that. There we go. When I get to statement four and I evaluate whether C is bigger than 100, now because it's 103, 
I will be breaking out of it, the loop, right? So when I link these two together here, the 103 is what breaks me out of the C is bigger than 100 over there, okay? So that means that C must equal not 97, not 98, but 103 at the end when it breaks out of that loop. I hope that helps people that were having trouble with the coin problem. If you did not get the coin problem and you don't understand it and you just say, oh my God, that is way too much work. Um, please again, remember every question is worth the same points. If there's a very easy question, go answer the easy question. Save this one for later. Choose your favorite letter from A to D. Okay. So that is the coin flow chart question. The answer to that is also written out a little bit more briefly in the answers PDF. But that was a very detailed explanation for anybody who needed it. Yeah. Um, one question from the chat. CSEA book number 4, 13, 12, 14. Should we read those? Uh, please hold and I will look up which ones those are. Booklet four is understanding and interpreting written material. No, that is different than understanding and interpreting a manual. Booklet 13, educating and interacting with the public has nothing to do with your exam. That is not one of your topics. Booklet 12, evaluating conclusions in light of known facts. No, that's, that's a whole separate topic. It would say literally that if that was one of your subjects, it would say evaluating conclusions in light of known facts. That is what they always put when that's the topic. And number 14, that's the same thing, evaluating conclusions, verbal analysis, no. Okay. The only relevant CSEA booklets are 17, which is preparing written material, and 25, which has some flow charting problems in it. That's about it. The only other question is about COVID screening, which we won't be able to answer. Yes, that's true. So otherwise we're all done? Otherwise we're all done. All right. I will post about the new live stream that I'll set up if anyone wants to do civil service Q&A, post-test Q&A celebration um i will remind you when we get to that though you're not allowed to talk about what questions you saw on the test that is not allowed you can say what types of prep were maybe more useful for you than others um but you are not allowed to talk about what was on the test do you have more examples on interpreting a manual other than the two i did uh, I did three. <laughs> I did do three. I did the CSD, uh, the civil service one about the security guy. Uh, I mean, I didn't do it very well because I forgot to give you the full question, but uh, the civil service one about the security guy and the ones that I made was two different manuals. I have a number of other manuals, like I said, but I have not yet made questions based on them and making questions is the hard part. Making sure that I've got a relevant manual that is pretty clear and easy to understand and uh, making sure that when I post that, that it has the correct answers is also hard to do. So if I get a chance to try to make some more questions, I might, but please do not count on it before your test next week. All right. So I think it's time to... It's time to skedaddle. Happy studying, rock out, do awesome on the exam next week, Good and luck. you don't need luck, you got preparation. I mean, they can have good luck too. Okay, you can have luck too. Thank you, everybody.